Hi, I'm Nikki Mulitz and this is my podcast, Come to Mind. My guest today is Stan Katz and I'm really excited to have him here. So Stan was a pioneer in the radio industry in this country and he started 702, which is an absolute landmark in this country. And I really am excited for him to share a little bit more about his story. And I want to know about the ups and the downs and, you know, what the journey's been like for him so far. How's that for an intro, Stan? That'll do. Good. Is that all? That's all. (laughs) That is all. So I I think what I'd like to know from you, Stan, um, with bearing in mind that Today, I really want to start to develop an understanding uh, about the impact of social media in terms of the affirmation, the likes, the comments, the followers, and uh, what effect it's having on society today. And I was thinking that who better to ask but someone who rose up to, I suppose, hero standing uh, and what that journey was like, how it impacted you, um, and maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that. I think I was very fortunate in that at, at the age of 23, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Um, most people I come across don't know that, very few people do. And my illustrious career was almost over before it began. Um, I managed to get an interview at what was then Swazi Radio, operating out of Johannesburg with a transmitter in Swaziland. And um, I walked in and said, there were three people interviewing me. And I said, I want to be a disc jockey. And they said, we're not looking for disc jockeys. What do you know about programming? And I said, if you tell me what programming is, I'll tell you what I know about it. And the interview was over. <laughs> they said, thanks for thinking of us. Thanks for coming to see us. And as I was walking towards the door, I thought I'd better pull something out of the hat because I'm dead in the water here. So as I reached the door, I turned around and I said, I've got a BCom. So I got a job in admin as the administrative assistant to the company secretary. I was the office boy. But I was in, and I had my own set of keys. Night after night, I would go back to the station, to the studio, and work till the early hours of the morning, practicing, preparing uh, auditions, and submitting them. And every time there was a vacancy, I'd be there with my little tape, and they'd appoint someone else. But eventually, I. Um, I, my opportunity came, I got a show, I was, um, I became the, as, as I was the assistant program manager at this stage, and Burks was the program, John Burks was the program manager, and uh, he said, you know, this assistant program manager is nothing, we'll make you music manager. I went, fine. Uh, I got into radio because I love music. I wanted to be close to music. So uh, I became music manager, and then they appointed someone, they recruited someone from Australia as music manager, and I became the assistant music manager. It was a bit of a blow to my ego, and was the first lesson I learned about ego. I thought, my first inclination was to leave. And then I thought, you know, if I stick around, I'll not only know what I know, I'll know what he knows, and that's what happened. I eventually became program manager, and then when I thought I was ready, I pitched for the general manager's job, but he and I went on the same, working on the same schedule. Uh, I submitted a long report explaining why he was doing a lousy job and why I thought I could do a better job. Actually, that went on fabulously. Well, I submitted it to the owners, not to him. Mm. And they submitted it to him. And he called me in one day, I was taping my show, and he said, can I see you for a minute? I said, I'll see you when I'm finished taping my show. He said, no, Uh, I need to see you now. And he said, I hear you're not happy with the way I'm running the station. I said, that's right, and I 
intend to resign. What could I say? I see the X coming. He said, when? I said, at the end of the month. He said, that won't be necessary. You can leave now. And I was out. And then um, after a rock concert, I managed a rock band. Then I got a job in Los Angeles, in the heart of Hollywood, working for a legendary radio and TV personality, Wolfman Jack. And I worked with some of the best people in the world. Um, and I had to be out of the country when my status was changed, my green card because I've been working, and if the question arises, have you been working, and you say no, and it turns out to lie, you jeopardize your chances of citizenship. So my immigration lawyer said, if you're not in the country, it doesn't arise, no issue. So I, um, I left, I thought it would take a couple of months, it took longer than I expected. So no, two, we're just starting. And the guy who fired me was now running 702. It was a music station. And um, had a long story out. He tried to take over from the then managing director, and I fired him. And uh, I, uh, I started out as sales and marketing manager. Oh, and I had a show. I was doing the morning zoo. And uh, landed up being the managing director, running the show, and then we sold 702 to Prime Media, one of their first acquisitions. I was one of the founders of Prime Media and the CEO of Prime Media Broadcasting. We acquired other stations like 94.7, Cape Talk, I started Cape Talk. And then we acquired KFM. Can I go now? <laughs> no, we're just getting warmed up. Then. Uh, I mean, your story, uh, I've, I've chatted to you before, obviously, and I know the story, but every time I hear it, it's just incredible. I want to know, why did you want to be a DJ? You know, there's obviously a difference between being on the radio and hearing your voice heard versus being behind the scenes. What was that driving force about? Very simple. I, uh, I play guitar. And my dream was to be a professional musician. And uh, I think it's probably the quickest way to start. Because um, if you see what musicians earn, it's, it's pathetic. Uh, they work damn hard and get paid very little. I thought, if I could be on radio, I could be close to the music. And there was nothing on radio at the time that was worth listening to. It was a schlock. It was real crap. And I thought my mission in life was to enlighten people as to what is good music. And I had my own choice. I could make, choose my, my own music. And I developed a bit of a cult following. But yeah, it was new, wanting to be close to music. I didn't, at that stage, uh, think about being famous or anything. Uh, it occurred to me afterwards that I was an applause junkie. I wanted the affirmation. Um, the amazing thing about radio, and people in theatre will tell you the same thing, you can arrive there feeling really down, having the worst day of your life, and you switch on the mic, and somebody phones to tell you what a groovy guy you are, and you just lift. Uh, actors, and people in theatre call it Dr. Theatre. I call it Dr. Radio. So, yeah, I, I like the adulation. I'm used to it. Sure, sure. Mm. And I mean, it probably rose uh, progressively as you did through the ranks as well. Um, uh, as it rose, the less it meant to me, because it's, you know, there's the imposter syndrome as well. I didn't think that I was worthy of the adulation. I thought they were stupid. I was expecting any minute to be caught out, you know. So 
the thing I loved about radio was theatre of the mind. You create pictures in people's imaginations. And the pictures in the imagination are stronger than pictures in any other medium because they're in the imagination. They're all pictures. The picture is unique to every individual listener, the unique person. And I enjoyed that part. I enjoyed creating the persona. And the persona I created was not who I was in real life. You know, I was, I'm an introvert. Um, I started not enjoying the attention. Um, I would like to have been anonymous, but it, it wasn't in my hands. Uh, the station had a very powerful PR department, so I was constantly promoted, and the press latched onto it, and uh, they rose. Now, the thing is, the higher up the ranks I rose, the further away I got from the reason I got into radio in the first place. I was no longer hands-on creating. You know, it was the creative part of the, uh, of the job that I enjoyed. And as I began sitting on boards of directors, writing reports and meeting uh, analysts, doing presentations wasn't, wasn't for me. While you were talking about uh, why you wanted to get into radio, your passion like, is tangible, um, to be close to the music, to share your passion with the world. And as you rose up, moving further away from that, plus feeling like this uh, imposter, that the person that the world was seeing was not actually Stan, it was just someone that you had created in order to interact with the world. Um, and what was that impact on you? On what? Uh, that being, almost having like a double life, <laughs> what you saw. Well, I think I went a bit crazy. Um, I started living like a rock star, um, treating my body like an amusement park. And, uh, I had a limo at my disposal, so I would go out partying every night with a driver. I didn't have to worry about getting home. Um, so, yeah, I partied nonstop. I worked hard, but partied very hard until my life started resembling a badly designed roller coaster. Sure. And, uh, but that was many years later that I realized I had a straight up with fly right. Sure. I did. We did happiness play a role for you? I don't think I was ever happy. And I didn't see the purpose of happy. I thought, um, I, I, I thought, I looked at the future. I, I was trapped between those two awful eternities, yesterday and tomorrow. And I thought if only I would accomplish that, or get that, or do that, the other, I'd find happiness. But it took me most of my life to realize that it's not in what you do or what you have, it's an attitude. Absolutely. You know, I can't help but think while you're speaking, uh, you know, the theme of the world today is People have got some really great messages and great ideas. And, you know, social media allows us to connect with uh, people all over the world where we never would have really had that opportunity. And how the message gets lost along the way, exactly as you're describing, where it becomes more about the affirmation and the acknowledgement and shifting away from the authentic self to you know, giving people what they want as opposed to giving me what I want. Um, and that need for someone constantly recognizing and you know, acknowledging that what you're doing and almost having to push the envelope you know, as, as you get to that point of, okay, it's just not enough now, so I need to push even further. Um, and I was wondering how that resonates with you. 
Well, I think most of the stuff on social media is crap. Uh, people whose deepest thoughts uh, are summed up in a meme which is not even original. People repeating memes endlessly. Um, my approach, or my interest in social media is from the advertising point of view. Now, and the impact that that's having on traditional media. For example, it's killing off print. Um, we saw in this country uh, a couple of months ago, magazine divisions and some of the biggest print companies closing down because, uh, you know, in the past you get your news from print and then radio and television and now it's instant, okay. you know, and this has also given rise to fake news, which is another another problem. You've got to sort through through uh, all the, the dross to find out what is true. What it has done, and I was reading today, uh, the New York Times. The grey lady, as they call it, is doing better than it's ever done in the past four years. It's quadrupled its share price because people are now prepared to pay for good journalism. So while it's killed off a lot of the advertising revenue, they've made more than made up for it in subscriptions. So they call it social media. I think of it more as anti-social media mm -hmm. because, you know, um, I'm currently running a series of webinars on radio sales and I think I, I speak about radio because that's my area of expertise. Sure. I'm not an expert on social media, so we can end the interview now and you can get someone who knows what they're talking about. My interest is in what social media is doing to traditional media. Now, these algorithms are supposed to be so spot on that they will pinpoint who should be receiving what message. I can't believe some of the messages targeted at me. I think, well, what was I searching on the internet? I'm not sure how the algorithm has tied up uh, anyway. So, so um, I, I'm now preaching to people in radio to go back and sell the attributes, remind people of the attributes of radio. Radio is the ultimate social medium because, first of all, as an advertising um, um, medium, radio has no skip ads function. It's intrusive. If the radio's on, you're going to hear the ads, whether you like it or not. And it's up to the radio station to match their audience with the advertiser. It's called brand synergy. And then there's the theater of the mind, the personal aspect of radio, which is personal to each individual. A lot of people, a lot of media directors that I run into don't understand social media. They understand that they need to analyze data. And there's a very interesting documentary on um, Netflix. You might have seen it called The Social Dilemma. Sure. Well, that sums it up, doesn't it? Um, we're being manipulated. We are the product. Uh, that's what uh, Facebook and Google and all of those are selling. They're selling us to advertisers. But there's, a, I think there's a big change is coming down the pike because Google is being sued in America, massive antitrust uh, lawsuit. Uh, Facebook is, is going to face the same issues. So I think in time it will shake out. It just seems like very early days. Um, there's a lot, I suppose, that's positive. 
there's a new generation. Uh, there's a guy, Brian Solis, who works for uh, Salesforce. He is the evangelist for innovation at Salesforce. This COVID-19 in 90 days gave rise to a whole new generation mm -hmm. called Generation N, which is Generation Novel. Uh, before it was Generation C, which was the connected generation, always, always connected. Well, this new generation cuts across psychographics, uh, sorry, across demographics. It's not uh, the old uh, division between Generation X and Generation Z. It's now people who are using social media uh, to search. Um, they're doing the, before they buy anything, they have thoroughly researched it. They found the best prices. Uh, they expect their advertising media to be intuitive, to lead them down the right path. And I think that is the biggest issue that traditional media faces, is how people are sourcing information about products and services that they want to uh, acquire. I hear all of that. Um, and what it comes down to for me is uh, the authenticity and integrity of things. And, you know, that's moving away from what your belief system actually is uh, and being like catering to the masses, giving the masses what they want as opposed to, you know, what was what was the honest message? What was the plan? What was the focus? And I was listening to your story, um, how that happened for you. And it's, you know, like boiling a frog. <laughs> Doesn't realize he's being boiled until it's too late. And moving away from that authentic self in order to get the, that, like you described, being that applause junkie, that if I'm keeping people happy, that maybe it might rub off onto me and be happy, and I'll be happy. And these media houses that have closed down, I think, have strayed away from what the original message maybe was in order to try and cater to what people were looking for. And the reality is, I think that we crave authenticity. We crave like being able to connect with someone on a real level. And at the moment, I mean, social media is certainly probably one of the furthest things from that. You know, I, I remember I once saw one of these e-cards on Facebook, it was a long time ago, and it was about meeting some, a partner. And it said, I'm totally falling in love with who you're pretending to be right now. <laughs> and like that for me sums it up. Uh, you know, and it, like you said, generation novel, whatever's novel now, that's what they're going to go for. And I think that we're missing the point. And people's anxiety and depression levels are skyrocketing. Well, this is the thing. The question is, are people happier today than they were or they're unhappier? And I, I think that part of it has to do with the pandemic that uh, suicide rates are up. That's going to say, that's going to tell you something. I always ask people, post-COVID, do you think human behavior will change significantly? Do you? Uh, I think it will. It has to. For people that are going to be able to adapt to this new world and this digital age that we're living in, I, I think it's going to make massive changes. And people that are struggling to adapt, and I'm not talking, you know, these people that are very busy and active on social media. Those aren't the people that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people that can still stay true to themselves and not have their message or their, uh, their vision or their belief system diluted along the way. Uh, those people will be okay. And, like, I know a lot of your stories, Stan. And at the moment, listening to you speak, this feels like a really authentic version of you. And it took a whole lot of ups and downs, and this roller coaster took you through tunnels and like well, steep Nikki, drops. You, you were there. <laughs> and I think 
it took, it's taken me the first 70 years of my life to find some modicum of peace, so clean and serene. Um, but I had to go through all kinds of hell to get there. And I think what I have learned is, and I think what the pandemic is teaching us is there are many things in life. The Stoics would argue that most things in life we have no control over. But the one thing we do have absolute control over is our response to it. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. And I, I, I wish I would have learned a lot sooner, but I'm happy that I learned before it was absolutely too late. Absolutely. And I credit you with a, with a lot of that. You worked very hard on me. Uh, and like sitting here with you today, um, it's a completely different interaction than, you know, in discussions that you and I have had before, where in the process you lost yourself. And now it's like you've come back to you and you remembered who you were to begin with. And I think that that's my hope for people through this pandemic and learning how to really utilize this, because uh, I think it's a beautiful thing, this connection all over the world. If we learn to, to use it properly and effectively and to be able to uplift us as opposed to kind of tear us apart. Um, and I really want to thank you for making this time and seeing uh, the growth and the change in you and seeing back into, like it's, it's almost like your two personas have merged now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you for inviting me. Again, thank you for being part of my journey. Big part. The most important part, I might add. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I look forward to doing this again with you and hearing more and more about you, like just continuing on the path of Stan as opposed to being closed on Thank you. Thank you.